world. This is Tim Ho with Lean Construction Blog and Real Life Lean, bringing you the Lean in Action series, where we interview superintendents, putting these lean practices and tools into place. I'm stoked to be joined today with Nick Clements from O'Shea Builders. Nick, how are you doing today? Yeah, I'm doing good, Tim. Uh, now I appreciate the opportunity to join you this morning. And uh, yeah, looking, looking forward to uh, diving into it. Yeah, looking forward to our conversation. I think uh, a lot of these interviews, I see these folks on on LinkedIn and see the content you're posting or commenting on and see a lot of alignment and a lot of drive towards the lean world. So I'm really excited to to have a conversation uh, with you. You mind sharing a little bit about yourself, maybe a little bit of your background and where you're working and, and what you're doing? Yes, yeah, sure thing. Um, so I am a carpenter by trade. I've uh, been in construction for about 24 years now. Um, <clears throat> I live in central Illinois. That's where I was born, raised, uh, work for a regional sized um, uh, G GC uh, contractor and um, <clears throat> I've been working in healthcare. I've been with uh, O'Shea for about 15 years, uh, and most of that time has been spent working in two different healthcare systems here in Springfield, Illinois. Um, five years with one in the last 10 years with uh, HSHS. And um, at HSHS, it was just numerous smaller projects, kind of the easy button within that organization and that, that facility. Um, so just projects stacked on top of projects and, and, um, uh, had, had a lot of fun down there the last 10 years, learned a lot and, and, uh, pretty early on my lean journey still, um, you know, a couple of years into it and still, still learning. That's why I'm, I'm out on LinkedIn and listening to podcasts and really diving into, you know, just continuous improvement and development. Um, so that's me a little bit professionally, I'm currently a superintendent kind of transitioning into, a field excellence role working with uh, our different superintendents and trying to elevate that role of superintendent and bridge some of the gaps that we see with our lean our lean journey so um that's me professionally personally i've got a couple kids um uh, married with a, a 11 year old daughter and a seven year old son and uh, again you know central illinois and this is where i grew up and we built a house uh 2010. So we've we've recently sold that house and moved into a smaller house with a bigger yard. Uh, we love the outdoors and just uh, trying to trying to get outside and find time to to get outside and enjoy it. So yeah, that's awesome, man. That's uh, super similar to my family and I. We you know love being outside as much as we can be. We're we're out there. So that's awesome, man. Um, so I, I sounds like you've been you've been with O'Shea for you said 14 years, 15 years now. Yeah, is lean years. something that's new to O'Shea? Is it, it? You said you've been on your lean journey about two years. So is that something new that you guys have kind of tackled? And uh, did you ever hear about lean? It's pretty cool that you were a carpenter and came up through that. Did you ever hear lean anywhere in your uh, your journey through becoming a carpenter? No, really, really, I didn't. Um, <clears throat> O'Shea kind of started diving into lean with our leadership team in 2017 as they were kind of working through their three-year strategic plan and trying to figure out what the areas of focus needed to be for the three-year plan. And um, one of the one of the items that came up was uh, advanced project execution and, and deliver. Um, <clears throat> advanced project execution is, is one of the items that came up for our three-year strategic initiative. And uh, that kind of led us down a journey the next couple of years researching how projects and construction would be delivered in the future. And that led us to uh, working with a couple of different lean consultants and doing a uh, evaluation of our organization. And um, early 2020, we started implementing last planner system on a few pilot projects. And that was really when I was introduced to lean um, through those pilot projects. And Early on was pretty overwhelming, but, um, you know, just trying to figure out where to start. And it's just so much information out there. So it's like just like, where, where do you hose. bite off? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> where do you bite off the small chunks and where do you start? So um, the way it was introduced to me was really from our leadership team. And, and you know, we were we were introduced to the last planner system. And that's where we started. And that's kind of where we've developed from. It's an awesome spot to start. I think it. You can see the incremental changes almost daily, right? As you go through your daily huddles and you start to see the better communication on site. So 
it's a good spot to start. I think that's where that's where I started on my lean journey. You know, started fake lean five years ago, six years ago maybe, and really started to put it in practice probably right around you, you know, two three years ago. Really jumped into doing it more the correct way. But I think it's really cool that you mentioned that your company started at the top down. You guys started with your executives getting on board and and pushing that out to the people. That's so cool to hear. Um, I'm a company I work for, CRB, our executives are big into into lean, but we're a large company. We've got like 2,500 employees. So it's hard to, you know, the leadership's not involved in the day-to-day. They're they're a little bit higher level. So they want to hear that we're implementing lean. Um, and we are, but uh, really to have it pushed down from the top, it, it really makes for a much easier transition. So um, that's yeah. awesome that, that they took that <laughs> introspective look and saw how they could improve. So you guys started organization wide with Last Planner system. Is that kind of where you guys stand now? Every project is is through Last Planner. Yeah, for the most part. And just just circling back to the uh, you know the leadership, but I, I feel like that's one of the things that makes us unique in our region. Um, it it really has been passed down from our vice president. You know, he he dove into it and just just grabbing hold of all the information and trying to figure out how to implement it within the organization. Um, we started out with, hey, this is the direction we're going. You know, it's 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 kind of like safety. There, we don't have an option. This is the direction we have to go to meet supply and demand in our region. Um, just because we didn't have the huge pool of manpower resources and to pull from. So we had to make some adjustments. We had to implement some of the tools and that's kind of how it started developing. Um, But as far as the last planner system, I I would say, yes, across the board now we are using the last planner system. Uh, Some of our smaller projects aren't, they're not using as many lean tools or they're not as structured, but um, across the board, we're using some form of lean within the last planner system. So that's awesome. Sounds like you said you've been at the same healthcare facility for like 10 years now. So you guys are probably like their go-to. I worked on a facility for a couple of years like that where all their projects just kind of came to us. So you're probably managing, at one point, I think we had 30 or 40 small little things we were managing. Um, Do you guys use Last Planner like down to that level or do you kind of use your Last Planner more to manage that whole portfolio? Yeah, so we we do um, and I guess... You know, my role within that system, uh, I would manage the smaller projects, kind of the easy button, the the cath labs, the, the one-offs, um, things like that. And then we also have other superintendents within that healthcare system managing larger projects. Mm. So it, it kind of just depends where we started using TACT. Um, both projects we utilize last planner system our our huddles our daily huddles our weekly work plans and and our collaborative approach with our trade partners um <clears throat> within I, I would say the big picture within the projects that i take care of down there it's more like the personal organization and how do you how do you um optimize your time how do you eliminate context switching and a lot of that stuff came from Jason Schroeder. I, I attended a, a super PM boot camp back in early 21, went out to Phoenix. I think it might have been his first uh boot camp and oh, and really cool. grabbed a hold of some of the personal organization stuff and it kind of stuck and I took that and ran with it because I could really see a lot of the flaws in the way I was leading projects with the just the numerous projects. I mean, you waste so much time shifting oh, from yeah. one one item to the other. So that was really the basis. I couldn't learn lean until I figured out how to manage my time. <laughs> and yeah, you had to like kind of introspectively look at yourself and see how to get yourself organized and in an order before you can go start trying to make some significant change. That's really cool. I'm hoping to get out. I'm going on paternity leave here in a couple of weeks, but when I get back from that, I'm hoping hoping to meet with my uh my manager and get get myself a ticket book booked to the boot camp there with jason and the elevate team just heard great things about that course so um, yeah, really, cool. really hoping to make that happen so it sounds like you've done a lot of your career was pre lean pre last planner system now you're kind of making this transition on your lean journey what do you think makes a lean project or a project that's using lean tools better than a traditional project or why does it make for a better project uh i guess whenever i think about lean i think about collaboration and communication so 
rather than just the GC or the owner saying, this is the way we're going to build it. This is the way we're going to do it. it. It's utilizing the experience of the team. And when you utilize and collaborate with the trade partners and everyone is bought into and, and adds to and builds the plan and logistics on what not only makes them successful, but what makes the project successful, you know, a lot better. Um, the process in the system's a lot better, you know, throughout the construction process, and that gives you a better end result. So um, just utilizing that experience of the team, solving yeah, problems. I mean, op- optimizing the whole there. It's unique. I see when you really get moving with the crew that, you know, you're kind of base everything in respect, and it's a it's a whole collaborative planning process. And, you know, oftentimes these guys have so much knowledge about stuff that's even outside of their scope that you've forgotten about. I always lean on my electrician right now on this project I'm at. I, I have a, an electrician, then I have a separate low voltage vendor. And um, my low voltage guy, he's got a pretty small scope, so he's in and out. But I got my electrician, he's looking out for him. He's saying, hey, you got to call that guy. Remember, he needs to be in here for this. You need to make sure he's got this covered. And, and he's almost like helping me review scopes, but he's helping keep me on schedule with those guys. And I think had we been going kind of in an old school, just push out a P6 schedule to these guys, it would have it would have been a totally different uh, different ball game that we were working with. So the collaboration, yeah. it's just it's huge. Um, yeah, you see you see the different levels whenever you're trying to implement lean, and and some guys grab a hold of it a lot quicker and easier, and some guys are a little more reluctant. So yeah, we've even seen that um, internally, and it's like if you really lean into the guys that are grabbing a hold of it and embracing it and, and focus a lot of your time and energy on those guys. A lot of the other guys will elevate to that level as well. So even with the trade partners on your job, you know, that guy that's that guy that's helping out that guy that's being the champion, if you're focusing your energy and and resources on him, a lot of the other guys are going to elevate to that, to that level as well. Yeah. That's the way we take it. We try to let's praise the guy doing it well, right? We want to call him out in our daily huddles when they're doing something right. We celebrate when you when you hit your planned dates, uh, but we don't break down the guys that aren't doing it. You know, the yeah. guys that miss some dates, it's like, hey, you know, that that's that's OK. What can we do to be a little bit better rather than than try to, you know, hit them over the head with the contract and, and mm-hmm. be all upset? Because um, that's, yeah. you know, I've realized that's what all of these guys are. They're used to. They're used to being treated that way. And it's it's not right. So try to make those incremental changes. Uh, that kind of leads me to my next question I got for you. Um, what do you think the biggest hurdle towards lean implementation is? I guess can take that question a couple ways, either as a GC or maybe why is the industry as a whole not, you know, what, what hurdles does the industry industry have trying to get lean implemented across jobs? Yeah, I think as a contractor, whether you're a GC or a trade partner, I think the, the first hurdle is change. And <clears throat> if you're a, if you're a leader, you're you're you adapt to you know you adapt to your environment, and if your environment's broken and dysfunctional, you adapt to it. You don't realize it's broken and dysfunctional. Like if you're constantly in a firefight, <clears throat> you don't necessarily see that there's fires all around you. So how how do you influence or encourage guys to change whenever they don't realize there's something broken? I guess that's kind of the first hurdle, and and then you think about maybe maybe with some of our clients or owners, architects, maybe it's that level of transparency and just really opening up and and being more transparent and and that that level of trust. It just that trust historically has not been, it hasn't been there in some of those relationships. So it's hard to it's hard to open that door if you know. O'Shea, we're pretty fortunate in our region to have repeat clients, repeat trade partners on our projects. So it makes us a little bit unique with our lean journey that we can maybe move a little bit faster than some of the other contractors that don't have that luxury. Um, But uh, I I would say the initial roadblock is change and just getting guys to realize they are living in a broken system. Yeah, I think uh, I was listening to a podcast that Jason Schroeder was on. And he referred to it as um, what do you call it? Learned learned helplessness, I think, is what he called it. Learned hopelessness, mm-hmm. and it's like you just learn to accept that that's what the construction industry is. We're du- we're behind on schedule. We're over budget. We're working 70, 80 hours a week, and that's 
that's what we do as an industry that there's nothing better that is just what we've kind of written off as our future in this industry and it's it does it, it's surprising it's hard for people to understand that there is a better way to do this and that's not how construction has to be done uh, a lot of a lot of habits to to change mm -hmm. there so i think that is a it's a a big hurdle for the industry and i think that you know having little people around the country light on fire with lean is is kind of where you, you see it start to spread i think the thing that the lean construction blog those guys are doing the things that jason and schroeder and and his group at elevator are doing just are huge for this industry that there is a better way to be doing things so it's, it's exciting there's some promise there that's for sure um so in your lean journey here, you probably acquired quite a few skills and, and you, you kind of come to see a lot of different traits within different folks. But what would you say the number one trait that a lean builder can have is? Uh, I, I guess, um, you know, everybody throws around that term respect and, you know, respect for people. So I think what does make what what makes someone respectful? And how do you build a level of trust? And and a lot of it comes down to just your communication and listening skills, I guess, would be a big one. Um, how how am I listening and respecting the person that I'm trying to communicate with and that we're adding value to each other? You know, I make him successful. He makes me successful as a project leader. And um, so communication is key, you know, that that listening skills and that level of respect. Um I, I guess a close second would be open, be open minded and just realize that there is a better way of doing everything we do and just continuously improve. Yeah, seems to be a common answer. I, I've, I've been hearing a lot and I was talking with uh, Buddy Brumley last week about the same question and we were laughing that you never hear someone say that it's it's the guy with the most technical experience on this or the guy with the most years experience with bags on. You know, it's always a guy that's got an open mind, respect, a good communicator, willing to put in some effort and towards some change. So a uh, pretty common answer, but I, I think it's it speaks to, don't want to make it sound easy, but how easy it is to implement lean is mm -hmm. you just have to be open to change, um, have an open mind and, and, you know, you can make a huge difference within your company. So yeah, uh, figure out how to connect to people. Yeah, I think that's a big one, right? That it's not this, uh, trying to figure out how to say it, but it's just connecting with people on a better level, right? You kind of drop the egos, you drop the titles, and it's just more connecting with people out here doing hard work that you need to lean on as as experts in what they do. And uh, I think that old school mentality is away from that. It's I'm the super superintendent here for this general contractor. We're gonna do it the way I say, because my ass is on the line uh, instead of respecting them and and building those those individual relationships up. So that's huge. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah. How much uh, how much higher of a level or how much more quality would we get out of a conversation if you came in Monday morning and I was able to call your kids by name and ask how their baseball game went this weekend or ask how, you know, ask ask how you and your wife's dinner was Friday night or how date night was, you know, it's like, it just breaks down that defensive barrier and opens up the whole line of communication. Yeah, you're, you're if you open up that line of communication. You come at things from a totally different level at that point when you can, and I try to do that outside of my form and I really try to get to know all the guys from the crews when we're doing lunches and stuff like that. Like it goes a long way to call someone by their first name. Someone, when you got a job site of, you know, 40, 50, 60 people on site and you can, you can, get 75% of them by their first name and ask how they're doing. Like that goes a long way with them. And I think that it's, it's not that hard to do, um, mm -hmm. but it's, it's important. I think it's super cool when you start seeing that happen in between trades, right? I got foreman now that they know what each other do on the weekends. They know their kids are playing this sport. And it's super cool to hear them catching up after, you know, on a Monday morning and their stretch and flex or our safety huddle about, Hey, how did your car run this weekend out at the desert? And, you know, Oh, did you end up going to that baseball game? Oh, I was there too. Like it, it's a it creates a big feel of camaraderie and, and almost a family on the job site, which just makes everything flow better, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, so we're talking about all these great things about lean construction. What do you think one of the largest misconceptions about lean construction is? Uh, I, I guess that, you know, the whole 
do more with less. So if, if I talk to you about lean, you don't necessarily know what lean is. You think that I'm asking you to work harder and I'm asking you to do more with less. And it's like we don't we don't respect the process and the system that lean is. We just think about the end result. If we respect the process and the system, it enables us to do more with less. But it's because of all the different parts and pieces that play into it. So I think that the biggest misconception would be just not understanding the system and the process and just thinking about the result and that I'm asking you to do more rather than giving you extra help. Yeah. I think the word lean just as a word is interesting, right? People think lean, I need to trim. Okay. I got to cut budget. I got to cut my staffing. You're going to have less time to do this. And it's, it's a bad connotation that a lot of people have. And even after you're introduced to her to a while, I mean, I've spoken with with project managers that have been, you know, thinking they're doing lean for a long time. And they're talking about, I gotta, I gotta lean out my, you know, we're doing lean on this job. And it's like, okay, well, lean's a whole thing overall. You don't just do lean on a job. And I gotta cut my staff and we gotta cut hours. And it's like, okay, you're you're going down a whole different rabbit hole than what lean construction really is here. Um I think that kind of ties into one of the last questions I had for you, but why don't more superintendents implement lean construction? I think part of it is that just a lack of understanding, but curious if you had any other thoughts as to why, you know, you've got a group of superintendents that work under you and it sounds like sometimes they take to it and sometimes they don't. Have you found why those that don't, don't do it? Yeah. Um, I mean, that, it's the change thing, I guess. And just guys, you know, it, it starts out with that again, just guys not realizing that there may be a dysfunction or an issue with the way that they're leading a project. Um, some of the guys, and I don't remember where I heard this, but it, it really rang true with it's, you know, whenever a guy does something a certain way for a period of time, it becomes your identity. So when you're asking them to change and do something different, it's like you're threatening their identity. and um, I'm asking you to change and be different. It's like, well, I, I don't want to be different. That's who I am, you know, and, and I'm this hard nosed guy who does things a certain way. And it's like, <clears throat> if you don't have a high level of trust and you aren't able to communicate with that person, you can't really show them the value in the system. All they see is that you're asking them to change the way that they're leading that project. So I, I think that some of the situations that we've struggled, it's, it's because the leader doesn't understand why you're asking them to change or maybe we haven't been the best communicators at this is what's broken this is why we're trying to fix it so i think that i never really thought of it that way as people take take an identity and kind of how they've been doing things but if you think about it like a superintendent that's been 25 30 years in the trade and maybe they've got 10 years left like why would they want to change one and two yeah they're probably so rooted in those those values as being, you know, some of them probably enjoy being feared or they enjoy mm -hmm. that power that that they feel they have as a, a senior superintendent. You know, it's that's a unique way to to approach that situation. I, I really like that quote that you said there. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I kind of see that over and over again. If if we do have somebody that's resisting it a bit, I you feel like it's kind of that old school mindset and just trying to break down those barriers. But, yeah. Interesting. So what's uh what's next for for Nick Clemens on your lean journey? Where do you see yourself? Where do you see yourself going? So um, trying to shift somewhat from the tools to the people. So um, Duan, one one of the the groups that I'm partner or one of the groups that I'm a part of. Uh, Duan mentioned that you know as a superintendent you go from eighty percent tools to and 20% people to kind of flipping that upside down. And, and as you develop your leadership journey, develop your lean journey, you shift more towards 80 to 90% people and, you know, 10 to 20% tools. So just really trying to figure out how to connect to people and trying to figure out how to elevate our field teams and our field leadership and um, bridge those gaps that we're seeing with our leadership and our lean journey and just trying to figure out how to take that to the next level. It's like the the tools are pretty easy to, to learn. You could almost teach anybody the tools, but it's leading um, leading the project with the lean tools and the leadership uh, where sometimes there's some gaps. So, yeah, I think that's that's some of the hardest, right? Our company always says it's 
80% culture, 20% the tools we use. And I think kind of leads into like a misconception we were talking about earlier. A lot of people think that lean construction is just last planner system. And it's like, that's a tool, but you need to have this whole cultural mindset around how to apply that tool. So if I can teach you the right headspace to be in, you're going to take this tool and be able to run with it in the direction you need to. I think that's really cool that you're you're kind of making that that flip there and and getting more into that role, being able to mentor and bring some people up in in the lean community. That's awesome. It's awesome. Yeah, and we're, uh, I mean, our our company's growing fast too in our regional market. It's like we we need to make some adjustments to to be able to keep up with supply and demand. So um, this is definitely a way to get there with the with the leadership and the lean tools and and We've got a lot of younger guys coming into that role as superintendent. So working with some of those guys and orienting them into our lean systems. And you know, we call it the O'Shea production system. And that's kind of our field handbook on lean and the last planner system and how we implement these uh, these things out on our projects. So oh, that's really cool. Is that like a specific in-house training you guys do for your mm-hmm. is it just for superintendents or your your project teams come go through that? Yeah, so we're currently on cohort three of our superintendent 2.0, and that's really orienting our guys into the O'Shea production system. It's about six months long. It's uh, seven or eight superintendents. We try to keep it a smaller group. So we're we're in the middle of cohort three currently and planning to start cohort four before the end of the year. And then just really looking at our development, our, our employee development and our field development and just building up that farm team so we're also kicking off a field excellence which kind of goes back a step with our our self-perform uh crew leaders our our carpenter foreman and the other guys that are working towards becoming a general foreman and a superintendent and and kicking off some development there kind of like an 099 level of uh learning and development so just figuring out that yeah yep I, we, I I hope someday our company gets to a level like that where we've got our kind of own internal system we're putting people through. That's that's awesome. Do you guys have anything that you do like that for trade partners? And maybe as you're like onboarding, kicking off a project, do you guys do a lean onboarding? Yeah, we'll do. Uh, we've done a couple last planner workshops and it's like a one or two day workshop, depending on the size of the project and the number of trade partners that are in the room. But um, we've done those on several projects and and seen a lot of success there. But we're really developing it, Tim, with our with our trade partners, and we're starting to get some good buy-in in our area. And our trade partners are taking kind of taking the ball internally and running with it and developing their own lean system. So we're trying to keep up with each other and trying to figure out how we can align and get better. So we're, we're awesome. really like pushing each other, yeah. right? Like, yeah, hey, you should be doing it this way, and really, really helping get each other on board. That's sounds like a really good group of people you've got and I know you were saying earlier you get to use those folks a lot on project to project so you guys are just probably creating this machine out there through O'Shea Builders that's just coming in to execute jobs extremely efficiently and that's that's got to be exciting yeah, yeah and we're I'm really excited to get in there someday yeah. Yeah, that's awesome man yeah that's we're awesome. moving in a good direction and and just um consistently seeking that feedback and figuring out how we can get better because you know what your vision is and what your assumption is as far as how you're executing a project may be something totally off from what what your trade partners are experiencing or what the client's experiencing. So just that feedback loop and that plan, do, check, act and continuously improving yeah. together. So oh, that's really cool, man. Yeah. Well, hey, I appreciate your time this afternoon. Um, is there anything else you were hoping to chat on or touch on here today that we didn't get to? Uh, how about a book recommendation from you as far as uh, developing a new, um, a future leader into lean and the O'Shea production system? I, I'm back and forth on a couple different books for our field excellence course. I like that. So I'm just scratching the surface of lean specific books, but I'm a huge just leadership book reader overall. Um, I would say... The Dichotomy of Leadership by Jocko Willink is a really good book that kind of helps you look at like both sides of different decisions you have to make. Um, But the book that I've really based a lot of my leadership journey on is um, Extreme Ownership, also by Jocko Willink. That's just about owning what you do. And it's really helped uh, really helped me in my journey 
I cool. I love reading, man. You guys have any other books that you you're keeping in that list there? I'd love to hear some if you've got them. Yeah, a couple of our um, foundational books, uh, the, the Lean Builder. That's one of our prereqs for Superintendent 2.0. So we asked the guys to to go through the Lean Builder book with uh, Joe and Keon, and um, we actually just had a, a workshop a couple months ago with Joe and Keon here here locally, and that was really awesome. You know, we've been on our last planner journey for several years, and those guys come in, and it's just like knock our you know. Blow, blow your socks off with uh, some of the information and just some of the different things and the collaboration that those guys are doing with their trade partners and internally. There was a lot of great information there, but um, that's that's a big one. And the Elevate Construction Superintendents is also a big one with our leadership. So Yeah, those are great. I got both of those. Uh, those are really kind of what sparked me a few years back. Uh, the Lean Builder was a few years back and then Jason's book, uh, I think I read early last year. Um, those are great lean lean books, though. Um, yeah, it's really cool. I'm I'm stoked on this superintendent 2.0 things you guys got going on. That just sounds like an awesome. The fact that you guys are putting in the effort and like there's a there's a pre read list before you get started in this cohort. You need to make sure you go through these things, and it's very yeah. it seems very intentional for the type of leaders you guys are trying to grow up. So kudos to to O'Shea on that. That is really really awesome to hear you guys have something going on like that. Yeah, thanks, man. Now it's been uh, it's uh, been a fun journey, and like I said, we're just getting started. So yeah, that's great, man. Hey, well, it's been been awesome getting to know you a little bit here this afternoon, Nick. Uh, appreciate your time. If there's ever anything I can do for you, please feel free to reach out, man. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Good uh, good talking to you, and same goes for you, sir. Appreciate it. All right, catch you later. Have a good one. Bye.